Hi, I'm Maris with Level Up RN, and in this video I'm going to be talking to you about reflexes in the newborn, the heel stick procedure, and some medications that are commonly uh, administered after birth. I'm going to be following along using our maternity flashcards here. These are available on our website, levelupRN.com, if you want to get a set for yourself. And if you already have your own set, I would invite you to follow along with me. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So first up, we're going to be talking about primitive reflexes. So just across the line, all of these reflexes that we're talking about are going to be present from birth. Now, uh, we do have these nice tables here for you with lots of information um, as to what the name of them are, what uh, how long they persist, and what the exact description of them is. So if you want more information, I would encourage you to look at these flashcards. Um, but a big one here is going to be the Moro or Startle reflex. This one disappears usually around two months. If you've ever seen an infant, um, you have probably observed this reflex. This is going to be that they extend their arms, then they bend them in and uh, kind of cry in response to a sensation of falling or to being startled, like a loud noise or sudden movement. So, you know, the baby is always like sleeping, they're just having a good time, whatever. Then either they feel like they're falling or they hear a noise and they they put their arms out like that, right? They, I always feel like they shake, like they kind of extend their arms and then they're, ah, you know, because it's, I mean, it's scary, it's startling. So um, this is a very common one that you will observe in the infant. Um, walking or stepping, this is where if I'm holding the baby up, here's my trusty doll Molly, if I hold the baby up and put her feet on a flat surface, her feet will sort of extend as though she is stepping or walking. Uh, she cannot actually bear weight, right? But this is a protective uh, reflex. Rooting, um, this this is where the infant is kind of searching, right? Their, their cheek and mouth um, uh, might get stroked and they're going to turn their head thinking like, is there food there? Uh, can I can I get some food, please? So um, my daughter did, had like a really ex exaggerated rooting reflex and we used to call it ostriching um, because when we would hold her, if she was really, you know, starting to get hungry um, and I was preparing, like I was warming up my breast milk that I had, that I pumped, uh, her dad would be holding her, you know, like, it's okay, mommy's getting it. And she would just be like this, her head was just like bobbing around, because literally, it's this idea of, if I move my head enough, will a nipple fall into my mouth? <laughs> Can I find that nipple? So that's what that rooting reflex is, or in my family, we called it ostriching. Um, sucking reflex, so when the lips are touched, um, the infant is going to, to start that sucking maneuver, right? Again, we're very food centric as infants. Premature babies may have a weak sucking reflex though, that may not be fully developed. Some other reflexes that you may see, palm or grasp. If I put something in the hand, in the palm of the baby, they're going to grab onto it very tightly. So if you've ever been around a newborn baby and you're stroking their palm and they grab on it and you're like, oh, it's so cute. I hate to break it to you. It's just a reflex. Um, tonic neck reflex. This is where the head is turned and the infant extends the arm and leg on the same side or the the ipsilateral side, meaning the same side, while the contralateral, the opposite side, arm and leg, flex inward. So I turn the infant's head this way, this arm and leg go out, and this one comes in, and this is sometimes called fencing position. Uh, it looks like they are going to, like, if you've ever seen, like, fencing, you know, it's like we have one arm is extended and the other one holds a thing, so it looks like they're fencing. Uh, plantar grasp is the same idea as palmer grasp. If I put something up against like the base of their toes, uh, their little toes will curl inward around that. And then Babinski reflex. This one is important because it's it's important that the Babinski reflex be positive in a newborn, whereas if I have a positive Babinski reflex, something is very wrong neurologically. So this lasts until about 12 months of age, and when the lateral aspect of the plantar surface, or the outside of the sole of the foot, um, is stroked in this like upside down J motion, 
the infant's toes are going to dorsiflex and fan outwards. So fanning outwards and dorsiflexing coming up like that versus plantar flexing going down. So dorsiflex fanning out, um, that is going to be a positive Babinski sign, which is a good thing in an infant, a bad thing in an adult. Okay, moving on to the heel stick procedure. So I just wanna show you, we have like a really nice illustration here as well. So the heel stick procedure, um, it's, it's pretty easy to draw blood from an adult. It's not so easy to draw blood from an infant. So instead we um, stick the heel to collect blood. Now, again, remember we are adjusting to life outside of the uterus. Our circulation is not as great as it is in an adult. Um, so we're going to want to start by warming the heel. And there are specialized heel warmers you can use. You could put a warm blanket around the heel, uh, but we want to increase circulation to to that area prior to sticking it so that we can get better blood flow from it. Uh, we're going to th think of it sort of like when we do a capillary blood glucose, we're going to cleanse the area with alcohol and allow it to dry fully. Uh, and then we have lancets that we will use to uh, puncture the surface of the heel. And these are actually uh, specifically made for heel punctures. So they are a little bit um, longer of a, of a puncture than like, than for a capillary blood glucose. Um, and then that's where we're going to really squeeze that heel pretty well to try and get some blood out of there. So I want you to see that here in this green area on either side is where we would want to stick the infant. Um, we're not sticking right in the middle of the heel. We are most certainly not sticking anywhere else in this foot. We are sticking on the lateral aspects of the, of the sole of the foot here in the heel region. That's going to be the best place and also the least painful as well. So what sort of tests do we do for the infant at birth? Well, um, most genetic screening is happening between 24 and 48 hours of birth typically at that 24 hour mark. Um, and there are screenings that are state mandated. So this is by law, these have to be done. And typically they include metabolic screenings for things like uh, phenylketonuria, PKU, congenital hypothyroidism, galactosemia, and sickle cell disease. Um, there's also some testing that can be done, again, state to state, to check about circulation. Um, so making sure that the circulation seems to be um, in line with what we would expect. There can also be audiological screenings done to ensure that it appears that the infant is a able to hear, those sorts of things may be done as well. Um, so now remember PKU, phenylketonuria, is um, a genetic disorder wherein high amounts of protein can actually lead to death. So this would be something where you would really need to educate uh, the child's family about this finding. Okay. Lastly, I want to talk to you about medications that are routinely administered after birth. We This isn't on this card, but uh, in the biz, you might hear this called eyes and thighs, right? This is uh, very, very common. So there's three medications that we routinely administer. The first is going to be the erythromycin ophthalmic ointment. So this is an antibiotic that is applied into the eyes of the infant. And the reason for this is uh, it's prophylactic, meaning to prevent um, a condition called ophthalmia neonatorum. This is a certain type of condition that can occur in the infant if they are exposed to gonorrhea or chlamydia during birth, like coming through the birth canal. The reason we do this prophylactically is yes, we do very, uh, you know, we test the, the pregnant patient for uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, but it's possible to develop it later, right? Um, and then also what if this were a patient who didn't have prenatal care, we don't know their status. Um, and also remember that gonorrhea and chlamydia are typically asymptomatic. So the, the pregnant patient may not even know that they have this condition. So prophylactic, 
practically, just to prevent this, we give it to essentially every newborn unless their parents refuse. Um, the the two, so th those are eyes, right? We put it in the eyes. Now let's talk about thighs. We have two medications that we deliver via injection, intramuscular injection. The first is vitamin K. Now vitamin K is very, very, very important for clotting. And vitamin K doesn't cross the placenta very well, and it also doesn't come through the breast milk very well either. So this is very important to help a newborn with clotting, is to give them that sort of first exposure to vitamin K so that they can get those clotting factors taken care of. Um, and uh, they don't produce these sort of, like, they don't produce enough vitamin K themselves until about day eight. Well, so yeah, they may not be like climbing mountains and stuff and doing things where they might fall and hurt themselves, but they just went through a potentially traumatic birth, right? So we could have bleeding in the brain without even knowing it um, for a little while, and it's very important that we have enough ability to clot. So vitamin K is so important for clotting. So this is given I am in the vastus lateralis, the thigh. So there's your first thigh. The second thigh is going to be for the hepatitis B vaccination. This vaccine is going to be given routinely at birth, and then we give it, we give boosters again throughout infancy. Um, it's given at birth one or two months, and then between six and 18 months. Um, and the thing that is important to know about this is that because it is a vaccination, it does require that informed consent to be signed. So of the three things, hepatitis B vaccination requires a signed informed consent from the patients. It's here in black and white, or big bold red letters, Paris. Um, and that means that it's really important for you to understand because we have to be getting informed consent from the parents. Uh, we don't want to administer it in the same thigh as vitamin K for a couple of reasons. Um, first is these are small muscles that can only take a small volume. And the second is um, you'll see routinely hepatitis uh, B and vitamin K are usually administered in the same thighs every time. So like left is always vitamin K, right is always hepatitis B or something similar. That way we can assess for any kind of reaction as well. And if we see that it's happening, that, that we have a reaction, we have swelling, something like that. Well, if we gave them both in the same thigh, how are we going to know what they're reacting to? Um, now, if we have an infant who was born to a hepatitis B infected mother, then what we want to do here is give hepatitis B immune globulin and the hepatitis B vaccine to the infants within 12 hours of birth. So that's kind of an important distinction there versus a child born to a non-infected um, patient. So eyes and thighs, that's going to be how you can remember the three medications that we give routinely to infants after birth. I hope that review was helpful for you. I'm going to ask you some quiz questions so that you can gauge your understanding of some key facts that I gave you in this video. Alrighty, so first up my question for you is, by what age should the Moro reflex disappear? We talked about that Moro reflex, but when should it go away? My second question is that you are the nurse and you're assessing an infant and you notice that when their head is turned, they extend their ipsilateral arm and leg. However, their contralateral arm and leg flex inward. What is the name of this reflex? And lastly, my question for you is which three medications are routinely administered after delivery? Thanks so much and happy studying.
I invite you to subscribe to our channel and share a link with your classmates and friends in nursing school. If you found value in this video, be sure to hit the like button and leave us a comment and let us know what you found particularly helpful.